Here we are with part two of the five steps to having an empowered mindset. And if you haven't listened to the first part yet, that's okay. This one stands on its own. Although of course I encourage you to go back and listen to episode 269. Today we're going to discuss having a fixed versus a growth mindset and the tips for having a growth mindset, which will lead to feeling strong, confident, and empowered. So stay tuned. Welcome back to the podcast. Part two, very excited, needed to do this as a standalone. Um, I've been teaching this in organizations for many years and uh, the concept has been around a really long time, but I, and I'm a huge fan. So let me just get that out of the way. And again, if you haven't listened to the first part, it's fine. You can listen to this and then listen to that later, hopefully. So back in 2007, I want to say 2008, maybe 2007, I read a book that changed, really changed my life a lot, you know, and I read a lot, you know, I read a lot. I read an incredible amount. And this is one of those books that has stood, I mean, it's 20, 24 now. Well, by the time you're listening to this, it's 2024. And this is a book that has really stood the test of time and all of the later research. It's a, a book, it's called Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. And it's by psychologist uh, Carol Dweck. She's currently at Stanford University. Uh, I Back when I was first listening, I think, or first reading about her before her book even came out, uh, I think she was at Columbia University. Anyway, she's been kind of everywhere here. And she is one of the world's leading researchers on motivation and mindsets. So how can we talk about an empowered mindset without talking about her work? Now, her initial work was with kids, but she and, and others now have since sort of extrapolated her results to adults in their personal relationships and at work. And uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about her work. You know, he, he's made it, you know, he's so amazing and has made her work even more popular in the last decade. Um, I, I mean, er, you know, she's just, ev she's, she's everywhere. And especially again in the business world, uh, we really like things that are evidence-based research that we know work. And so, you know, how could you not have Carol Dweck as part of what you're doing, applying to organizations to be more effective and to leaders to be more effective. But again, parents, to me, the mindset, that book, should, it, it, I think it even, the subtitle was something like for parents, teachers, and coaches or something. That was the original idea. I think it's the best parenting book I've ever read, even though that's not its sole purpose, but I will say that. And, I, and you know I read all parenting books because, you know, I was a crazy Jewish mother, so of course I read everything there was <laughs> and, and continue to. Uh, so the basic premise of her work, of Dweck's work, is that there are no naturals or born with it uh, people, you know, students, athletes, artists, whoever you're talking about. We, she says that we're, you know, we use these words like smart, talented, athletic, and artistic, but that's really, it's not like you're born with those things. I know people will come for me in the comments for sure about this. It, it's, it's, that's not, there's been a lot of research showing that's not true. Obviously you can be born and you're six foot, you know, 11 and you, you know, you, you could obviously be born with certain, uh, physical characteristics that lend towards things. And, and clearly if you were born, um, with a, a mental IQ of 80 versus 280, you know, very different things. So obviously there's things that uh, you're quote unquote born with, but this idea we have that you either have it or don't, you know, you, you were born with it. This idea is, it's very American. I, I don't hear it as much from with the, my work with people in other countries over the years. Um, but it's, it's, we, we Americans love it. <laughs> we love this idea that there's some super thing and that I can't do it just because you did it. I can't do it, you know, because you were born with it. You are smart. You're talented. You're athletic, all those things. And even though there's so many, um, examples, there's tons of them of people who overcame, uh, there was a professional basketball player for years, Muggsy, uh, what was his Bogues, Muggsy Bogues? Is that his name? Help me in the comments if it's not, you know, 
I think he was 5'8", <laughs> and he actually made it to the, the NBA. You know, things that shouldn't happen, but do. And it's really about this application. And I will tell you, even people who, like a Michael Jordan or a Kobe Bryant, very much believe in what I'm telling you today, that this, these teachings, they, they would say it also. So I, I do want to say that, but that we, so we're not born like talented or smart or athletic or whatever the thing is. It's really about our consistent attention, focus and practice. That's what it is. And what she found is that it's all about our mindset when we approach life and goals and relationships or, or challenges. She's, Dweck's research shows that your mindset is, a, is basically, well, Dweck says, like her, her idea, her hypothesis is that your mindset is a set of beliefs or a way of thinking that determines your behavior, your outlook, and your mental attitude. And that's something I said in last week's episode. But let me get really nitty gritty with this and specific. So let's talk about this growth versus fixed mindset. Cause Dweck talks about, she really talks about these two basic mindsets. Um, and if you want to feel empowered, you have to learn to have a growth mindset, which can definitely be cultivated. If you, as I'm talking, realize you have more of a fixed mindset. I will say that for myself, I had a very fixed mindset growing up. I was told I was smart. I was, you know, I was, I was athletic. I was smart. I was this, I was that. And, and the problem with that, and I'll talk about it is that when I faced challenges, I crashed and burned a lot <laughs> because, uh, you know, if you're smart, it should come easy. You know, I shouldn't have to study so hard. Uh, there, there's a way that we think, which I'm going to explain. I'm going to show you the research. You uh, get ready to get your mind blown today. If you don't already know about this stuff, it's, it's really great. So a fixed mindset, let's talk about that first uh, with a fixed mindset. You believe that your talents, talents, your abilities, that they're basically carved in stone and you don't want to take risks and think because you think that putting in effort is bad because it, you know, you think things like, well, if I'm smart, like I just said, then I shouldn't need to study. So if you fail at something or work hard, it means you're not talent, smart or talented because if you were, you wouldn't need to put in the effort. Does that make sense? That that's that idea with the fixed mindset. Things are very fixed. They are what they are. And there you go. You, there's no really room for movement. With a fixed mindset, it's like you really want to get it perfectly right away. So a lot of my perfectionists are very much stuck in a fixed mindset. And, and if you don't get it perfect and right away, you tend to give up really easily. And I can't tell you how many things I gave up easily in my life growing up because they didn't like come right away. People with a fixed mindset often ignore criticism. They avoid challenges. They prefer easier tasks. They get defensive more easily and are more likely to cheat, cut corners or lie. I know. And I did all that when I was uh, in my teenage years. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I was so storybook, uh, you know, textbook anyway. So for these people, for fixed mindset folks, setbacks are, they're really traumatic. What makes it worse is that the fixed mindset, it gives you no way to overcome a setback. I mean, if, if failure means you lack confidence or potential that, you know, you're a failure, where do you go from there? What, what are you supposed to do? So that's where fixed mindset sits. Growth mindset, on the other hand, someone with a growth mindset, they start with the premise that the hand you're dealt is just a starting point uh, for your development because everyone can change and grow through application and experience everyone in anything growth mindset folks have they have like a passion for stretching themselves and and sticking to it even or or maybe especially when it's not going well so if you have a growth mindset you see obstacles as challenges and believe that putting in effort is a good thing in fact putting in effort is what makes you smart or makes you talented. Success is in doing your best. It's in learning, it's in improving. Um, and setbacks for growth mindset people are seen as motivating, uh, they're informative, they're a wake up call. So you can see how different it is. All right, I'm gonna talk about the research before we, cause you really, 
you need to get what this is and especially um and not just for parents listening but for everybody listening because you'll realize how much you do it at work or with yourself or with other people so so i'm going to take a minute and talk about this initial research so you can really see how all this applies to you okay um and i would say even if you're ever planning to become a parent listen closely but but it's for everybody so Dweck started her work by studying the effects of praise on students at 20 New York City schools over a period of uh, just about 10 years. And here's what she did. And it's very simple. So don't, don't, you know, just listen closely, but you'll get this. It's not too complicated. So here's what they did. They went into classrooms and they gave kids a simple puzzle test. They did, this is what they all, you know, the researchers, right? The people that the student, it's usually a student. I was a psychology student. We did lots of, uh, lots of research. Um, so, and what they did was they would arbitrarily divide a class into two groups. So this is a class that had often been together, right? They didn't, you know, like for months, maybe depending on when they came in the classroom. And, you know, so some kids were already the problem kids or were already the smart one. You know what I mean? You know how that is in any kind of classroom, okay? So just think of that. So, but they would come in, they'd get, a, they'd get the, and they sign kids numbers. You know, they were just arbitrarily divided. So they didn't know who was deemed smart or not smart or funny or not funny, whatever. It didn't matter. And in group, let's say in the first group, in group A, Kids were told they would take this test and everybody took the same test. And in group A, kids were told their score and given one line of praise. These kids were praised for their intelligence. So they were told their score like, hi, hi Jane, you got an 85. You must be really smart at this. That's it. That's all they said. Okay, that's it. Group B, then the second group were given their score, but they were praised for their effort. So, you know, now it's, uh, oh, uh, hello, Juan, you know, uh, you, you got an 85. You must have worked really hard. Okay, so see that? So group A is praise, group, that's it, one line, one line. So, and why only one line, right? Dweck said that they wanted to see how sensitive the children were to this one line of praise. You know, may, you know this is what you do when you research. You don't know what's going to hit or not. So you want to start somewhere where you can build. So, okay, so that's what they did, okay? So the kids all took a test. One group was told you were smart. The other group was told you must've worked really hard. That's it. Now they gave these, state, these students were given a choice of a test. Choice one was a more difficult test than the first, but the students were told they'd learn a lot from attempting it, okay? Choice two was an easy test, much like the first one. So here's what happened. Of those initially praised for their effort, right? Their effort. 90% chose the harder set of puzzles, 90%. Of those though that were initially praised for intelligence, over 70% chose the easy test. So the quote unquote kids who were told they were smart copped out. They just wanted to be, take something easy so they could be smart again. Where, and again, th there could have been kids who were told they were smart before who were in the, the effort group or were in the praise group. You know what I mean? It didn't matter what they were before. This is just, that's why it's so, to me, so incredible. So why? So Dweck said, when we praise children for their intelligence, we tell them that this is the name of the game, right? We tell them they should look smart, don't risk making mistakes and avoid the risk of embarrassment. Okay. Yeah. So that's why the, the kids who were praised for being smart chose this easier test. And the kids who were praised for uh, their effort took the harder one. We're trying harder. We're wanting to get in there. All right. Then they did another round. This time they gave all the kids a test that was two years ahead of their grade, le grade level. So of course it's a force fail, right? Everybody fails. But those praised for effort on the first test assume they simply hadn't focused hard enough on this test. So what they did, they got very involved. They tried multiple solutions. They worked right up until the end of the time that was given to take it. Those praised as smart initially, they assumed their failure was evidence they weren't really smart, right? And they were all miserable. They didn't try hard. They didn't take, you know, work out problems differently. They gave up very quickly. They didn't use much of the time at all that was given for the test. I know, then it gets worse, okay, it gets worse. So, so now all these kids have this 
artificially induced failure, right? So now they do another round. And this is not all on the same day, okay? But the students that were given a test as e they, they were now given a test as easy as the first one, that very first one they took, right? So they failed. Now they're giving a test that's just as easy, if not easier, than the very first one they took. The kids that were praised for their effort, right, in initially, significantly improved on their score by about 30%. So now they took the same test again, but they were trying harder. They were doing more, all from one line of praise, one line. But the students that were praised for intelligence initially, they did worse than they had the first time. Yeah, about 20% worse. <laughs> is this crazy? So what Dweck said at kind of the end of this is that when we emphasizing effort, well, when we emphasize effort, it gives a child a variable they can control. They come to see themselves as in control of their success. Emphasizing natural intelligence takes it out of their control and provides no good recipe for responding to failure. Do you see that? And there have been repeated experiments by Dweck and others that found this effect of praise on performance held true for students of e different socioeconomic classes, for different uh, gender, boys and girls, ethnicity, different age groups, even preschoolers and people in college. I know it, it's such robust research, which is why I love it. So Benjamin Bloom is a, a famous educational, educational researcher, and he studied 120 outstanding achievers. It's really an amazing um, study, but anyway, uh, he had concert pianists, sculptors, Olympic swimmers, world-class tennis players, mathematicians. I mean, everybody. He, he had research neurologists. I ate everybody. Most weren't that remarkable as children, okay? And didn't show clear talent before they really started to train, really started to get into it. And what Boom concluded, again, studying all these people over all this time, he said, after 40 years of intensive research on school learning, this is in the, in the United States and abroad, my major conclusion is what any person in the world can learn, almost all persons can learn if provided with the appropriate prior and current conditions of learning, okay? Now he didn't count the bottom two or 3% with impaired learning or the highest two or 3% with exceptional aptitude. I wanna say that, and I'll link to the research in the show notes and on the blog post, but so, you know, always think of a bell curve, you know? So he didn't go all the way out into the, the thin lines of that curve on either side, uh, because those are really gonna be the outliers of anything, but everybody else, yeah, I know. So, and there's a really famous story about how Michael Jordan, who I think everybody knows, right, basketball player, he was, you know, it's a famous story. He was cut from his high school varsity team. He wasn't recruited by the college he wanted to play for. Uh, it was like North Carolina State or something. And the first two NBA teams that could have chosen him didn't draft him. And, but back in high school, he was devastated when he was cut in high school. And apparently the, he gives a story that when he complained to his mom about it, he says that she told him to go back and discipline himself. So this is what's so good. She didn't blame the coach. She didn't blame anyone else. She didn't say, oh, it was unfair what they did and they didn't, oh my boy. She put the way to success squarely on his shoulders, in his court. And he credits this with much of his success and the mind, his, his mindset when it came to basketball that her thing was you didn't try hard enough. You need to be more disciplined. You need to put yourself back out there. When we blame coaches and other people or the teacher sucks or whatever, again, there's that victim mentality, right? Uh, oh yeah, I can't do anything. Oh well. It, and then people blame others. My coach didn't put me in. This person didn't put me in. Um, and this happens quite a bit. So, and again, it happened to me, you know, when I went away to college and here I am at this great school and I crashed and burned initially because everybody was smart, not just me. <laughs> and most people were smarter than me and I hadn't learned to study well. I, I didn't have the mechanics of good studying. So I really crashed and burned at first. I mean, I'm like a perfect example of this. And so, uh, for me, it happened after I got sober, you know, when I got clean, um, I really 
st- I was work. I had to work hard at that. And I was in multiple rehabs and tried multiple times to get clean before I did. And it was something that I had to keep persevering and trying and trying and figuring out and overcoming that, you know, finally it really became the bedrock of me. And I'll tell you just right now that my son, Max, my wonderful boy, uh, absolutely had a very fixed mindset. So here I am knowing all this. I knew this when he was born. Okay. I, from day one, I, I tried very hard and I didn't do a good job because I would forget and call him smart or call him, you know, this or that, you know, we use these words, oh, you're so good, you know, whatever. We use these words very easily. Um, he was born in 2003. Like I said, I came to this around 2007 or eight and, uh, you know, and then of course woke up to like really applying it to my children better. And so sure enough, my daughter McCartney, who was born later, had more of a growth mindset right away and Max didn't. But what happened with Max, so he would try at school. It didn't come easily. Uh, we found out later he has uh, some learning disability and some other things, but regardless, he just didn't like to not look good. He hated asking for help. He is, was classic fixed mindset. So, and this was a boy who was, you know, ready to drop out of high school. He wanted to get a GED uh, here in the United States. Um, you know, it's a general equivalency diploma or a good enough degree as we like to call it sometimes. And uh, he, you know, wanted to drop out all the things. We struggled to get him to the finish line of finishing high school. I mean, struggled. He went to community college because, you know, he had no options. He had no, nothing he could really, he couldn't get into a right, you know, I wasn't going to pay for him to go to some expensive school where he was just going to fail again. He had to, you know, learn. And to make a long story short, he's, uh, you know, just finishing his second year with, with almost a 4.0, which is the highest kind of you can get. He learned to work hard. I, something shifted for him in the experience of going away, living away from home, um, really having to like dig deep. And again, I think all these things that I talk about all the time, he finally matured enough where he was able to see that it came to him working hard. He's always worked hard at baseball, which is interesting. He was a smaller kid when he was little. And so he had to work really hard to get good, which I think those kids tend to do better as opposed to the kids who are big right away and na- it kind of quote unquote can naturally hit the ball far, but they don't learn the right mechanics. So later they sort of peak in high school and because they haven't really had to apply themselves hard. And of course, as we all know, when you get to like, let's say a D1 school for baseball, everyone's really good, you know? So you're not just the little star from where you're from you know suddenly you're with a bunch of stars many of whom have learned how to work really hard to get where they are so now you're sort of thrown um I will say this happened to one of my nephews I believe you know anyway it's 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 something that you know happens and so uh and it and for Max it went you know for baseball he could see it that he had to work hard to get somewhere but for school he had this fixed mentality so it was interesting he sort of had a growth in one and a fixed in another and, but he has really shifted and now is applying to four-year schools and my gosh, is getting into all these schools that he never could have gotten into right out of high school and wants to go and is feeling motivated and empowered because he saw that he could work hard and get some, make some changes. So it's really, this stuff can be changed. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in my kid. I've seen it in my clients over and over. You absolutely can change. So if you have a kid right now that you're like, oh my gosh, my kid is so fixed mindset, um, or I am so fixed mindset, you can absolutely change it. So, but let's talk about what happens with adults because all of this applies to you as an adult. When you're, when you're looking for an empowered mindset, having a growth, growth, this growth mindset, it's critical because it reframes mistakes and what you might've considered as a failure as a natural part of the change and growth process. You, you, right? It's natural. You, of course, things are going to bomb. I, I, I do stuff all the time that bombs. It just is going to happen. You can then perceive like falling down or, or quote unquote failure as learning. So it's not failure. It's learning. It's, it's growth. It's, it's something else. And I teach about growth and fixed mindsets in organizations. And I'll tell you that one of my favorite stories is of a very famous growth mindset leader named Tom Watson. And Watson is famous for being the CEO of IBM at at a time when IBM became great. And the man, he's really who 
the man people credit with putting IBM on the map. Like he, he was the one, he made the change. It, the IBM supercomputer is named the, is named Watson after him, okay? So, but here's, here's what's really cool. So in the 60s, there was a journalist named Paul B. Carroll and he was interviewing Tom Watson for an upcoming, some upcoming article. And when he, so he's in the interview and then, but he, he's in the room and Watson gets wind of an executive who'd made a decision that ended up losing IBM about $10 million at the time. It would be the equivalent of about 80 million now in today's dollars, okay? So, you know, here we are. Uh, again, I'll link to all this, but so Carol, I guess said to him like, oh, you know, cause he said, oh, I got to call this guy. And he, Tom Watson was like, I got to call this guy, this executive in, you know, and Carol said, do you want me to leave it? And he said, no, no, stay, you know, you're here to interview me and see how I CEO, see how I lead. So might as well. So he was allowed, Carol was allowed to stay in the office when this executive was brought in and he described in that article, he described the following interaction. So he wrote, uh, as the executive coward, <laughs> Watson asked, do you know why I asked you here? And, the, and this executive replied, I assume so you can fire me. And he said, Watson looked surprised, like shocked. And he said, Watson said, fire you? Of, of course not. I just spent $10 million educating you. I need to know what you learned. Is that good or what? Yes, because... Th that's really, right? That's what growth mindset is. That you see that this huge loss, like we should learn from it, we should know. And now this person can become better. You know, this was a person I have in an executive position who'd actually been doing, a, the backstory of this guy was that he'd do, doing a great job and he did take risks and he took a bad risk, you know? So he his immediate reaction wasn't, oh, we just get rid of him and, and then tell our, state, our stockholders, you know, oh, well, we fired the guy, don't worry. You know, it was... Watson owning it and being like, yeah, we had this and here's what we learned from that. And you're, and you're going to have things like this. It's impossible to have a multi-million million dollar at the time company and not make mistakes. Right? So I know. So getting to a, an empowered mindset means having on some level a growth mindset so that you're not a victim ever it, that you are always thinking there's something you can do because that makes us feel empowered. There And there are four main ways cited in the research to help you shift to a growth mindset. So let's get to those. Let's do them. So, and they're quick and easy. Don't even worry about it. We're going to get right to it. So, and I guess I'll give you another tip, which is to read the book. You know, if you, if you have the energy, uh, I would read or listen to... Um, the growth, the mindset book by Carol Dweck. I think it's excellent. Again, Malcolm Gladwell talks about, I think it's in Tipping Point. I'm trying to remember which book he wrote that talks about this also. Um, but anyway, so the first thing to do is to focus on the process, not the person. That's number one tip I will give you. Focus on the process, not the person. So if, and this means you too, okay? So if this is your kid, if this is your employee, if this is yourself, if this is your partner, it doesn't matter who, you want to focus on what's our process? Like, how are we talking about things? What's our dialogue? As opposed to the person, like, oh, well, they're just not talented or they're just not smart enough or they're that language, right? That it's not about their personal characteristics. It's not trying to break things. When things aren't going well and people, we do this in arguments, don't we? We'll be in an argument with our partner and say, oh, he's such an asshole or she never listens or, you know, he, he just doesn't get it. He, and we label people constantly. He has, uh, he has such a low emotional, um, IQ or, uh, oh, she's bipolar. She's just depressed. She's anxious. She can't listen. You know, he doesn't listen. These are things we say, that's focusing on the person. Instead, you want to focus on the process. Well, okay. So when I went to talk to my partner, they were exhausted. It was a Friday at five o'clock. They've already told me they don't like to speak Friday, late on Fridays. Um, I didn't, you know, I was sort of walking past going, hey, could you take out the garbage? And they had literally just gotten home, but I was feeling harried from the kid. You know, that's the process. 
like, oh, maybe I could have picked a better time to say something. Uh, may, you know, I need to be more mindful before I make requests. The second someone walks in the door, you know, let's have a new process where I just write some things on the board that need to happen. And first I greet this person, we say hi to each other, we kiss and hug, you know, whatever, we, you know, how you doing, we make eye contact, that I make sure I'm not involved in my day too much, that we both stop and take a moment and connect. Do you see that? That's how you would do it in a relationship. Uh, you know, with your kids, I, like I've never asked Max when he's playing a video game to go do something. <laughs> I would instead look at the process. Oh, on Saturday mornings, we're going to spend 15 minutes. I, I also never told my kids, clean your room. Forget it. Forget it, right? You would get so much pushback for that because that's, to me, a bad process. Instead, I would say, okay, guys, it's, it's Saturday. It's not before they watch cartoons, before they did anything else. I'm going to set the timer for 15 minutes and you're going to clean for 15 minutes. And once that's done, we're going to go do fun stuff. And then I would go in the room with them and really I would mostly talk to them while they were cleaning or I'd help, it depends on how old they were. I would help them direct them uh, in what they were doing. You know, if they were really young, as they got older, we would talk about it. But I was mostly guarding that they weren't just throwing everything in the closet or under the bed, that they were actually putting things away. And I would just chat with them. I put on some music. We, I'd have one of them even set the timer. I had those old school kitchen timers everywhere. And do you see the process there? As opposed to my kids are lazy or uh, my kid never listens. Well, yeah, if your kid is already engrossed in video games or cartoons and is already relaxing, they're not gonna wanna get up and go do this thing you asked them to do. Like think of the process. Again, don't label the people. Does that make sense? So that is the quickest way to get to a growth mindset. Everyone feels good. Everyone's thinking in a different thing and people are seeing like, oh, I can do this thing. I can put in some effort and clean my room or make my bed or cook dinner or whatever the thing is. You know, I'm thinking of home things, right? And I'm thinking a lot of parenting things, but this, this is that difference. This is how you create growth mindsets in people where there's action, where there's not labeling, where there's not criticism and attack. Okay. That's that there's number one. Number two is I, we are kind of already said it, but I'm going to say it out loud again is to focus on effort, not outcome. Okay. And this is a biggie. So you want to focus on the effort people are putting in, not the outcome that they have. Uh, my kids knew if they got an A, but didn't do any studying, I didn't think much of that. I, I didn't ever think I give, we didn't give any praise for them, you know, with anything they did where it was easy. Like, like, oh, look what I did. I'm like, yeah, you know how to do that already. You already know how to tie your shoe, you know? Um, but if they didn't know how to tie their shoe and they couldn't tie it <laughs> yet, uh, if they couldn't tie it, uh, we would focus on the, wow, you put, you sat there for five minutes with your shoe. Good job. Do you want me to help you now? Do you want to wear your slip on sandals instead? Do you want, you know, you, you could do a lot of things there, but there's this focus on effort. And when things don't go well, it's still a focus on effort. Well, did you, you know, I didn't do well on my test, mom. Well, how, how much effort do you, I used to use a scale of one to six with them. Scale of one to six, six is you put in a ton of effort. You did all the work you could do. You feel really proud of how much you put in. One is no, I didn't do a thing. I really didn't put in much effort and I'm not so proud of what I did. When you ask kids this in this way, they will often tell you the truth. They will often say that, or if they said, and they will often give you a real answer. Like sometimes they'll lean a little more towards the, you know, how great they were, but a lot of times they'll not, they'll say, oh, I mean, I guess it was like a two, but if they even did say they gave a six, then I would stop and go, wow. You, if, and if I didn't think they did, if I, I said, well, tell me what you did. Let me hear about that six. Like what I noticed you were sitting in front of the TV last night, you know, not studying because you said you were done. Is that full effort to you like t let's talk about that let's talk about the process of how you study for a test right do you see where we're going again you, so you can kind of mix these together but effort effort not outcome is huge and again so and going back to number one you know not telling kids how smart they are or talented or whatever trust me i've had to bite my tongue a million friggin times uh to to not get caught in that like, wow, I'm really proud of you. you. You know, I know how much that meant to you and how much work you put in. That's what we talk about.
Do you see that? Okay. Much as you can. And again, with yourself. So maybe you haven't found the person you love yet and you've been dating and you've been on apps and you've been whatever. So number one, I would say to you, and you're feeling just, you're throwing up your hands. You're really feeling defeated. Like I'm never going to find this person that, you know, that to love. I would again, bring you back. So don't be beating up on yourself, you know, cause you might go to, I'm ugly. I'm this, I'm not, I'm, I'm a loser. I don't have a good enough job. I don't make enough money. I'm not thin enough. I'm not tall enough, whatever you go, right. You start to focus on the person, not the process. And instead you might go back to like, wow, these apps really don't make, help me shine. I, I don't seem to do well on the apps or on these particular apps. Like I've been using, I had one client, she was using free, all the free apps for a long time and not meeting anyone. And I said to her, what if you tried an app you pay for? Like that's showing a little more, people are putting more skin in the game if they pay and have to fill out more things. And so she tried that and she actually had some better luck, but not, it wasn't quite, still quite a fit. And then I said to her, well, what if you tried like a matchmaker? Have you tried to match with someone like that? Like, have you thought about that? Again, you know, and by the way, she had very good luck when she did that, but, uh, and that doesn't work for everybody, but I'm just saying, or, or I had someone who was trying to date and they were only trying to date. They lived in Montana or somewhere. I just said, you know, what about if you opened up the dating pool to other states? And she's like, well, I only want to live here. I said, you think that, but if you fell in love, maybe you wouldn't, or maybe you'd meet someone who is from New York city, who was like, Oh my God, I'd love to be in Montana. I don't know. Like you're, you're cutting, you're, you're not focusing again on the process. Like maybe you need to change your process and think of different things that you could do instead of just the same thing over and over and then deciding that there's something wrong with you. And the same thing, you know, effort, not outcome would be the same. Like I get that you haven't found the person, but you know, you're doing a great job. Like you're not giving up on love and you're not giving up on yourself. And that's so huge. I was in nine rehabs before I got it. You know, Hey, uh, I did not give up on myself. I have done many things in my business where I took a chance on myself, where I put money, I bet on me. And you know, some of those have failed and I've lost money and others have done great and I've made money. It's, it's, you know, but what, like not giving up and continuing to come back, sometimes changing my goal, but a lot of times not. A lot of times it's always, it's about putting in a different kind of effort. And if I'm not attached to an outcome, it helps me really see that I probably have had improvements, just maybe not the, the one I really, really wanted. So, but I'm, I'm not taking stock of the, the steps in the right direction. Okay. So when you focus on effort, not outcome, it really helps you do that. Okay. Does that all, I'm hoping that's all making sense. Number three is that when you're giving any kind of negative feedback to yourself or to others, and I already did it, you have to use the word yet. Yet is the most powerful word in your vocabulary for now on. It is the key to a growth mindset. It gives a time perspective. It gives a feeling of self-efficacy it uh, or efficacy with other people. Um, yet, yet, yet is the way you want to go. You want to think about um, anything with your kids. You know, I, I didn't make the team. Well, you didn't make it yet. Well, what do you mean? The tryouts are already over. It's already done. Like, well, you didn't, you didn't make that team yet. Try, you can try again next year. You can try for a different kind of team that's not at the school if you're really interested in basketball or whatever the sport is. You, again, there's always a yet, yet. Well, what else do you think you need to do? Focus on the process, right? Uh, what else do you think you need to do to improve your chances of making the team next year? Is there a space where you can go back to the coach and ask if you can even just practice with the team to get better? Because you never know. It, you might uh, find yourself getting better as it goes. I don't know. There's, there's always, there's almost always some, I would say there's always, but I know we're not supposed to say always or never something else you can try or do that will help you, um, create a different outcome, create, create the next thing, create some movement, create something to, to, to feel again, like you have efficacy in the world. Does that make sense? So yet is so good. Use it with your kids, use it with your partner and use it with yourself. When you see something that you think is a failure or not good, say, I don't have that yet. I haven't figured it out yet. I don't know where the money is coming from yet, yet. 
it is it gives us room to grow it gives us hope which we desperately need when we're having a hard time it and it's the truth it is the truth it is back to that everything is figure outable i i can i can do this somehow it's right there and number four is to give positive feedback or rewards for mistakes and thinking outside the box so you really want to get to um a space where and I'm going to give you a couple examples of how to do this. I worked with an executive for years who was years ago now, who was very into this um, growth fixed mindset. He loved it. He read the book. I was training his staff and him. He, he took to it like a duck to water. This is a really long time ago. This is probably 2000, gosh, 10. This is a while ago. But I, I always remember this because I thought it was so brilliant. And you... This, so he had an executive, he would have an executive meeting once a month with his kind of top guys. He, he ran a very large company, multinational company. And he would have this meeting, and in those days they were always in person, and people would actually fly in for this. It was a thing, once a month. And what he would do is have everyone go around and report their biggest fail. Okay, so he'd go around, I think there was uh, 22, 23 people. And he would go around, everyone would have to say the biggest fail they'd had that month. And you could never use a fail you'd previously had, okay? And so a fail, somewhere they made a big mistake, a big boo-boo, and they screwed up, and whatever that was. And, they'd, and then everybody got a vote, and you couldn't vote for yourself. But, so you couldn't vote for yourself, but everyone had to vote on who had the worst fail for the month, Okay. And then all the, you know, little piece of paper, he had them do it. Every went into like a, you know, a thing and his, uh, his assistant would go through and then they would have the rest of their meeting. And then she would announce who the, who the winner of the biggest fail was. And that person, he would go. So this man that I, who may, <laughs> I think yeah, this man had a helipad on his house. Okay. He was very, very wealthy, but he loved the deal at Costco. There's, you know, Costco is a big chain here. There's a deal where you can get a dollar fifty hot dog with a soda, and he just felt like, and that is still in place today, by the way. Costco has never changed that, and he felt like that was the best deal ever in the history of the world because he loved the hot dog and he loved the soda, and that was the prize. Whoever won the biggest fail, he, my client, the big boss, would go out and and buy the a hot dog soda for this person who won and that would be their prize. He'd get one for himself and for them and they would sit and eat their hot dogs together. That's what they got as their prize. And these guys fought for that. <laughs> this was like, and they got their name put up and it was like on this board. It was a whole thing. And they had fun with it and it was such a brilliant thing to do. And he got that because one of the things Dweck says to do, which I had told him and never thought about doing it in this business environment, um, Dweck talks about, uh, at, and I did it at our dinner table growing up with my kids, where every Friday we would share, go around the table, and people would share their biggest fail that week. Like, what was your biggest fail? What did you screw up the worst? It could be that you fell down. It could be that you broke something. Again, you couldn't repeat things. So Max was not allowed to keep saying, I didn't bring in my homework every week. Do you see where I'm going here? You know, you don't want that. You don't want to reward not bringing in your homework every week. But we'd have the biggest fail of the week. And again, we would all vote on it. You couldn't vote for yourself and somebody would win, right? Sometimes it got split because two people would each get two votes. But, and then that person got to pick the movie for that Friday night, the Friday night movie. They got to pick the movie back in the day. And it was like a really sought after reward and we would sit as a family and watch. But that, that is something Dweck had recommended doing, a positive reward or feedback for a mistake or thinking outside the box or doing something else and uh, my kids loved it it was so much fun and anyway I had told this executive that story and he came up with himself with I'm gonna do it with my guy you know with this group it was women too I'm gonna do it with this group of people and it was brilliant and these people again fight these people who made lots and lots of money were were just dying to get the Costco hot dog. I, I, I loved it. it. I thought it was brilliant. And I've told that story many times over the years because it was such a great way to encourage his people to think outside the box, to go for things, to take calculated risks, to not be, to not, and here's what's really big, 
if you get punished when you make a mistake, you're going to start to hide your mistakes. Uh, that's what very famously happened at Enron uh, here in the United States. That's a famous story of things gone very wrong in corporate. They hired a bunch of quote unquote it people, people who had the talent, you know, the like hiring talent. And these it people, of course, you know, were only praised for doing well and had to do well over and over. And of course, nobody can keep that up. And so they were hiding all the mistakes they were, they were putting. And that's what happens when you have a company that has a fixed mindset and bad things happen. People hide their mistakes. They go underground. They, I mean, they cheat, they lie, they steal. That's what happens. It's going to, it's going to be what happens with your kids. When that happens, your partner is going to do it. If that's the way your relationship works. I mean, it's going to be everywhere. And that's what you do if you have a fixed mindset and you don't want to admit, quote unquote, uh, something, you know, that you did, you end up lying about it or hiding it or cheating about it or something else. And so it's so important. It's, and it's the most disempowered way to live in a lie or in this kind of way. So having a growth mindset, you can see, I, I hope from all these tactics and all the things I'm talking about, where you approach things in this way, I can do anything. Everything's figure outable. Uh, I haven't gotten it yet. You know, it's not, a, it's not, I'm not going to denigrate parts of myself. I'm going to think about my process, how I got here. What do I need to tweak about the process? Not myself necessarily, uh, to get a different outcome. You know, that kind of thing. It's incredibly empowering. It's incredibly uh, uplifting. It gives so much hope and it will really change your life. So that's it. That is part two. Um, and I'm going to end with a quote by, uh, a famous, and I think the most winning basketball coach of all time, John Wooden. If you haven't read John Wooden's books, I highly recommend them. Uh, oh my God. He really the most beloved coach of all time and for good reason, but he has a famous quote that I love. And it's, he said, uh, it, he famously coached like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and other, you know, anyway, he said, did I win? Did I lose? Those are the wrong questions. The correct question is, did I make my best effort? If so, you may be outscored, but you will never lose. And that is a great way to end today's episode. Uh, it's the truth. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, maybe if you want to cultivate a growth mindset, you can also read things by Coach Wooden. Um, would be another great way to go. It is, uh, it, I have to tell you that when I really have employ and now these things are so much just a part of me I just do these things without thinking much although again in my parenting I have to come back to it over and over um, but and in my relationships I have to remember you know it's it's something to be mindful about but when you do it and it becomes a part of you it really does change your life and when people ask me like why are you always so happy number one I'm not always so happy obviously nobody is but I am most of the time hopeful. I, I do most of the time think I can figure things out that I'll get to the other side, even when things feel really scary. And, and of course they get scary and grim, uh, cause that's life. It's going to happen. I, I, I definitely have moments where I have to lick my wounds and, and curl up in a ball and do whatever. And then uh, that's over. And I'm like, what do I have to do next? And because I really do, uh, live what I teach. You know, I, I've learned these things over the years. I'm sharing them with you. I, I, I've seen my clients. I learn from my clients every day. I learn from you and your stories that you send in. This stuff works. So I'm hoping this week you can really think about a growth mindset. How do I employ that? How do I take these tips and use them? A, a loving reminder that everything is on the website, abbymedcalf.com. There's always a corresponding blog post for anything you're listening to under relationship tips and tools, and you can read and just take a quick hit from that instead of, you know, unless you like to listen again, some people do to make it, you know, cement it in, but other times you might just want the notes and they're right there for you because I love you and they're there. If you haven't uh, left a review yet for the podcast, please, please do uh, rate on Spotify or leave a review on Apple. It's hugely, hugely helpful to me. Uh, please subscribe and like if you're on YouTube watching uh, me and my fabulous fashions every week. Um, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I'm a fashion girl. I love my stuff. Usually I cry by the end. You get to actually see that instead of hearing it. 
Uh, I'm not crying today. Hey, I got through one without crying. It's a miracle. Uh, please know I love you. I do. I love you. I know you can do this. I'm so excited when I share this kind of information because I absolutely know it will help change your life. And that's what I'm here to do. Have an amazing week and I'll talk to you so, so soon.